Number seven, Maria Lulu Sosa. Texas man Ramon Sosa first met his wife, a Mexican-born personal trainer named Maria, at a nightclub in Houston in 2007. When they eventually got married in April of 2010, Maria, who had reportedly been in the United States on a short-term visa, was able to gain full citizenship, and they subsequently went into business together when Ramon opened up a boxing gym. Then a few years later in 2015, Maria indicated to Ramon that she wanted a divorce, citing the couple's financial troubles as the reason behind her decision to end their relationship. Shortly thereafter, a friend of Ramon's revealed that he'd been approached by Maria, who reportedly offered him $2,000 to kill her husband. Shocked and confused, Ramon contacted the police and began collaborating with federal agents on a sting operation aimed at gathering enough evidence to arrest Maria. In connection to her murder-for-hire plot, Maria met with an individual whom she believed to be a hitman, but was actually an undercover police officer. To deceive the woman into believing her husband's assassination had been completed, investigators took a picture of an artificially bloodied Ramon lying in a shallow grave and sent it to her. She was eventually arrested on a charge of solicitation of murder. It was later detailed how Maria had concocted the plan to murder her husband in order to inherit the fortune tied to his boxing gym. She ultimately pleaded guilty to her charges and was sentenced to serve 20 years in a Texas state prison. Number 6. Tracy Grissom On May the 15th of 2012, Alabama woman Tracy Grissom went to the Binion Creek boat landing at Lake Tuscaloosa and fired six gunshots at her ex-husband in front of witnesses. Subsequent reports detailed how two of the bullets struck the victim in the back of his arm while two others entered his back, killing him instantly. Prior to his death, the 28-year-old man reportedly faced criminal charges in connection to allegations of assault that had been made by Grissom during the course of their relationship. In her interviews with investigators, the woman maintained that she'd carried out the shooting as a form of retaliation against her alleged abuser. Grissom's legal defense team further argued that, due to her husband's repeated instances of assault, she'd begun suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, which ultimately served as a contributing factor in her making the decision to kill him. In Grissom's ensuing trial, however, prosecutors from the state's attorney general's office claimed that her assault accusations against her ex-husband were false and that she'd actually killed him in order to collect a $103,000 life insurance policy, of which she was the sole heir. In September of 2014, Grissom was convicted of murder and consequently sentenced to 25 years in prison. Number 5. Heather Mack On the night of August the 7th of 2014, Indonesian police received reports of a bloody suitcase having been left in the trunk of a taxi cab outside the St. Regis Hotel in Nusa Dua, Bali. Upon inspecting the suitcase, officers discovered that the body of a female victim, Sheila von Weiss Mack, had been stuffed inside of it. The police learned that the case had been placed in the trunk of the cab by a pair of suspects, identified as Tommy Schaefer and his girlfriend, Heather Mack, who was also the victim's daughter. It subsequently emerged that Mack had accompanied her mother on a vacation to Indonesia before secretly booking a flight for Schaefer to come as well. At the time of the trip, Mack and her mother had been involved in a heated dispute in which the latter was seeking power of attorney over her daughter. If awarded legal authority over Mack, she reportedly intended to force her to terminate her pregnancy, as she didn't approve of her relationship with Schaefer. In an alleged effort to subvert her mother's control, Mack, along with Schaefer, killed her in her hotel room with what was described as a metallic blunt object. After the authorities had found the woman's body in the suitcase, they arrested the two suspects at a nearby motel. It was later revealed that Mack was the beneficiary of a $1.6 million trust fund from her mother, which investigators believed to have been the primary motive behind the killing. Schaefer and Mack were ultimately sentenced to 18 and 10 years in prison, respectively, following their 2015 convictions on charges of premeditated murder. Number 4. Kenneth Atkinson On August the 15th of 2020, 
Oregon man Ray Atkinson Jr. and his fiance Natasha Newby were beaten to death inside the bend home that had previously belonged to the former's father, who had passed away a year earlier. Concerned friends of the couple eventually came upon their bodies in the basement, and Deschutes County officials subsequently launched an investigation into the matter which was classified as a double homicide. Although investigators immediately suspected that Atkinson's brother Kenneth might have been responsible for his and his partner's murder, they were unable to pursue criminal charges against him for over a year due to a lack of evidence. Court records indicated that Ray Atkinson Sr. had left behind a $400,000 inheritance, but had neglected to draft a will prior to his death. The absence of a legally binding document to officially distribute the man's wealth caused Kenneth and his brother to become embroiled in a dispute over which one of them was the estate's true heir. Detectives postulated that Kenneth might have resorted to killing his brother, thereby inheriting the entirety of his father's estate himself. By October of 2021, the police had finally collected enough evidence to support their theory, and they filed two counts of first-degree murder and two counts of first-degree conspiracy to commit murder against Kenneth. The latter was arrested along with his nephew, who was accused of assisting in the murders in exchange for an undisclosed share of the inheritance money. Number 3. Kamaya Hassel Shortly before 11 p.m. on December the 31st of 2018, Tyrone Hassel III, an active duty sergeant in the United States Army, left a family dinner party in St. Joseph Township, Michigan, to bring his wife a plate of food. The latter, 22-year-old Kamaya Hassel, was also a member of the Army and had reportedly been stationed with her husband at Fort Stewart in Georgia. According to subsequent reports, Hassel III was fatally shot in the head and neck shortly after departing from the family gathering. Following an investigation into the incident, the police identified Jeremy Kular, another soldier stationed at Fort Stewart, as the individual responsible for Hassel III's killing. The authorities also accused the victim's wife of being directly involved in the murder plot. It subsequently emerged that Kamaya and Kula had been involved in a romantic affair with one another and had devised a plan to eliminate Hassel III to allow them to continue their relationship. As was detailed by the Army Times, military officials provide a $100,000 death gratuity to next of kin when a service member dies while on active duty. Investigators expressed their belief that the financial gain associated with the death of Kamaya's husband served as an additional motive for the two suspects. Following a three-day murder trial that saw 23 witnesses for the prosecution, Kamaya was convicted and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Kular pleaded guilty to second-degree murder in July of 2019, and he consequently faced a sentence of 65 to 90 years behind bars. Number 2. Joanne Hussey Englishwoman Joanne Hussey broke into her grandmother's West Yorkshire residence on the night of May the 7th of 2007 and proceeded to brutally murder her with a garden spade. According to court documents associated with the case, the 77-year-old victim named as Annie Garbutt sustained a multiple of injuries during her granddaughter's attack, including fractures to her ribs, sternum and larynx. During the ensuing police investigation, local authorities learned that, in 2006, Garbutt's daughter Maureen, who was Hussey's mother, had been granted power of attorney over the elderly woman after she was diagnosed with dementia. Over the course of the following year, Maureen allegedly stole thousands of dollars from her mother's bank accounts. Concerned that her grandmother's life savings might be depleted by her residential care payments, Hussey devised a plan to murder her in order to inherit the money herself. Following a trial at Leeds Crown Court, Hussey was unanimously found guilty of murdering her grandmother and was consequently sentenced to life in prison. Although Maureen was convicted of stealing approximately $20,000 from the victim, she was spared jail time to allow her to look after Hussey's disabled daughter. Number 1. The Death of Richard Oland the lifeless body of Canadian businessman Richard Oland was found lying face down in a pool of blood at his New Brunswick office on the morning of July the 7th of 2011. Sergeant Mark Smith of the St. John Police Force later testified in court that the crime scene was one of the bloodiest of his career, with the most blows to a victim he'd 
ever seen. Upon examining Olin's corpse, a forensic pathologist counted a total of 45 wounds to his hands, neck and head. It was ultimately concluded that 69-year-old Oland had been bludgeoned to death by an assailant wielding a sharp-edged weapon of some kind. Shortly after the discovery of the murder scene, the police began conducting interviews with members of the Oland family, including the victim's wife and children. Video footage of the police's interview with the victim's son, Dennis, showed the latter giving a detailed account of his activities during the day prior to Oland's death. At the midpoint of the surveillance video, a St. John detective informed Dennis that they believed he was responsible for his father's murder, an accusation which he categorically denied. Investigators detailed how prior to his death, Olin had amassed a fortune amounting to approximately $37 million as the sixth generation scion of the Moosehead Brewery Company. Dennis was accused of committing his father's murder in order to inherit his share of the massive estate. Following his criminal trial, the longest and most expensive trial in the city of St. John's history, Dennis was convicted of second-degree murder and consequently sentenced to life imprisonment with the possibility of parole after 10 years. However, upon filing an appeal of his conviction, Dennis was granted a retrial, which took place in the summer of 2019. His defense was able to establish a reasonable doubt as to whether Dennis could have been at the scene of the crime when it occurred, and he was ultimately exonerated of the murder charge. The St. John police force faced considerable criticism for the sloppy investigative work that had led to their identification of Dennis as a suspect. Provincial Court Judge Ronald LeBlanc claimed that the police had failed to establish a motive for Dennis to kill his father, as it was Connie. Olin's wife, who stood to receive the $37 million inheritance, not Dennis himself. In November of 2022, wealthy cryptocurrency dealer and business manager Andre Zachary Rebello was arrested following an investigation into his mother's death two years earlier. The 26-year-old, who was in a high-profile relationship with Australian social media influencer Gracie Piscopo, was remanded into custody to face Sterling Gardens Magistrates Court on one count of murder as well as fraud charges related to the deadly crime. Back on May the 25th of 2020, 58-year-old Colleen Rebello was found dead inside her multi-million dollar home in the Perth suburb of Bicton. Her death hadn't initially been considered suspicious as her body didn't present with obvious signs of injury. However, investigators uncovered that Rebello had forged his mother's will in the days following her demise, flouting her documented wishes to have her body buried to instead have her cremated, thus destroying crucial evidence that could have revealed her manner of death. The man was accused of falsifying other records pertaining to his mother as well, including in requests for information and a death certificate. It was also detailed how his charges were, at least in part, linked to attempted life insurance fraud. Following her partner's arrest, Piscopo publicly indicated she was in utter disbelief about the allegations against him, which she said had deeply affected her and the couple's three-year-old son. Number five, Gladson Acacio dos Santos. In the summer of 2021, Brazilian authorities began investigating a cryptocurrency investment firm run by Gladson Acacio Dos Santos. Through his lucrative operation, Dos Santos obtained generational wealth that allowed him to lead a lavish lifestyle, including a sizable collection of luxury cars and high-end watches. However, when investigators started taking a closer look at Dos Santos' dealings, suspicions began to arise. In August of 2021, Brazil's federal police conducted a raid of the company's business compound, wherein they seized many of the man's expensive personal belongings, along with $28.7 million in cryptocurrencies and approximately $3 million in cash. The considerable confiscation was reported as the largest crypto seizure in the nation's history. Dos Santos was playfully dubbed the Bitcoin Fero after it emerged that his company was nothing more than a highly profitable pyramid scheme with which he'd conned more than 122,000 investors out of their money. He and four co-conspirators 
were arrested in one of Rio de Janeiro's most expensive neighborhoods following the raid. Then in December of 2021, reports surfaced that Dos Santos and his associates were being charged in connection to a murder plot targeting the man's crypto rival, Nilson Alves da Silva, the latter, who was 44 at the time, had been shot twice while stopped at a red light earlier that year on March the 20th. De Silva was taken to the hospital and although he was initially pronounced to be in critical condition, he ultimately pulled through and survived. Investigators determined that the attempted hit had been put out after De Silva began to spread rumors about Dos Santos's imminent arrest. The various charges levied against the former cryptocurrency magnate were still pending in Brazilian court as of the latest updates. Number 4. Aurea Vasquez Rios On September the 22nd of 2005, millionaire real estate developer Adam Anghang was leaving the Pink Skirt nightclub in Old San Juan, Puerto Rico, when he was suddenly stabbed and beaten to death in the middle of the street. At the time of the attack, Anhang had been accompanied by his estranged wife, Aurea Vasquez Rios, who sustained only minor injuries. In the immediate aftermath, local authorities zeroed in on 22-year-old Jonathan Romain Rivera, a dishwasher at the club, as their prime suspect. Anne Hang had purchased the pink skirt as a gift to his wife, so Rivera was known to the victim and his family as the investigation progressed. Suspicions also fell upon Vasquez Rios herself, who stood to reap substantial financial benefits from her soon-to-be ex-husband's death. Rivera was convicted of murder and sentenced to 105 years in prison. However, an independent FBI investigation subsequently exonerated him and instead indicted Alex Babon Colon. It eventually emerged that Colon had been offered $3 million by Vasquez Rios to carry out Anne Hang's murder. Facing the inevitability of prosecution, Vasquez Rios fled jurisdiction to Italy. While abroad, the woman reportedly sued the parents of her dead husband, claiming they cheated her out of her rightful inheritance. Her case was ultimately dismissed, however, and in 2013, she was arrested in Spain. In court, prosecutors detailed how Vasquez Rios had directly communicated with Colón and other co-conspirators on and before the day of Anne Hang's murder. She, her sister, and her sister's ex-boyfriend were each found guilty of multiple counts, including conspiracy and the use of an interstate facility in murder for hire. In March of 2019, the U.S. Justice Department released a statement revealing that Vasquez Rios had been sentenced to life in prison for the crime. Number 3. Ed Buck Ohio-born businessman Ed Buck was arrested in 2019 following a series of suspicious incidents at his home in West Hollywood, California. After beginning his career as a model and actor in Europe, Buck worked for a friend's data service company, which he subsequently bought out of bankruptcy and renamed Gopher Courier. Five years after the purchase, Buck sold Gopher Courier for a significant profit. Now a millionaire, Buck shifted his focus to the political sphere, leading the effort to recall Arizona Governor Evan Meacham from office over allegations of racism and corruption. According to the Arizona Republic, the anti-Meacham campaign made Buck a household name in Arizona politics in the late 1980s. He subsequently relocated to West Hollywood where he unsuccessfully ran for city council in 2007. The millionaire largely stayed out of the headlines in subsequent years until a young African-American man named Gemmel Moore was found dead at his apartment in July of 2017. Emergency crews came upon Moore, an escort, lying naked on a mattress in Buck's living room with an adult film playing on the television. The police uncovered adult toys, syringes and plastic bags filled with what was suspected to be methamphetamine at the residence. Although the LA County Coroner's report placed Buck at the scene of Moore's death, the district attorney declined to prosecute him. When news of the incident surfaced, rumors began to circulate regarding Buck's alleged history of luring young black gay men to his apartment, where he would inject them with methamphetamine for his own twisted gratification. In January of 2019, another African-American man, identified as 
55-year-old adult film actor Timothy Michael Dean was found dead in Buck's home under similar circumstances as more before him. The following September, Buck was taken into police custody and charged with three counts of battery causing serious injury, administering methamphetamine and maintaining a drug house. The arrest occurred after a 37-year-old man was injected with meth at Buck's residence but fortunately survived. In April of 2022, having been convicted of nine federal charges, Buck was sentenced to 30 years in prison. Number two. Peter Chadwick. The lives of an affluent family from Newport Beach, California, were irreparably destroyed. One day in October of 2012, real estate developer Peter Chadwick, who'd earned millions of dollars during the course of his professional career, hadn't picked up his sons from the bus stop after school, nor had his wife of 21 years, Ki Cho, the following morning. Peter got in contact with San Diego authorities, telling them Kicho had been murdered by a house painter named Juan, who'd subsequently forced him to remove his wife's body from their house, which rested within a purportedly secure, gated community. Law enforcement immediately found Peter's story suspicious, and after further investigation, he was arrested on suspicion of committing the murder himself. Upon being freed on a $1 million bond, Peter fled south to Mexico, where he remained on the run for several years. According to official reports on his time as a fugitive, the man used a number of aliases to avoid recognition, including the name Paul Cook. He moved from small town to small town until eventually settling in the city of Pazcuaro, four hours west of Mexico City, where he bought a condo and found a job. To explain his solitude, Peter claimed that his family had been on board the infamous Malaysia Airlines Flight 370 that disappeared in 2014. In May of 2016, he was involved in a car crash that claimed the life of a local woman named Claudia Soto and left her sister in a coma for 15 days. Although he wasn't ultimately found to have been criminally liable for the deadly accident, Peter left Pazcuaro in the aftermath, fleeing to a town called Valle de Bravo. Shortly thereafter, however, the man saw an investigative report on TV detailing the U.S. Marshal's attempts to locate him. Panicked by the news of the escalating manhunt, Peter skipped town once again. In August of 2019, he was finally tracked down by the authorities after nearly five years on the run. He later pleaded guilty to strangling and drowning his wife following an argument over the possibility of divorce. In February of 2022, then 57-year-old Peter was sentenced to 15 years to life behind bars. Number one, Andrew Rodriguez. A self-described multi-six-figure earner from New Braunfels, Texas, was arrested for running over a man on a moped on the night of June the 5th of 2021. 34-year-old Andrew Rodriguez, who reportedly earned his millions through cryptocurrency investments, had gone to Las Vegas to celebrate his birthday while driving to a party with his fiancée, 24-year-old Sabrina Junga, in the passenger seat of his Lamborghini Huracan. Rodriguez reached speeds of up to 141 miles per hour as he blazed down Russell Road near Decatur Boulevard. The man slammed into the back of a moped being ridden by 58-year-old Walter J. Anderson. The impact of the collision was such that Anderson was cut in half, with his torso reportedly landing more than 200 feet away from the rest of his body. The moped was crushed beneath the Lamborghini. Upon the arrival of law enforcement, Rodriguez emerged from the wreckage and said, I just killed someone. Although it's unclear whether Rodriguez was administered a sobriety test at the scene, Officers immediately noted the smell of alcohol, as well as the fact that the man's eyes were watery and bloodshot. He subsequently faced a felony charge of DUI resulting in death, the second DUI on his record. Back in September of 2015, the self-made millionaire had been pulled over while driving drunk in El Paso, Texas. Rodriguez's Mercedes had expired tax, and he had trouble keeping his balance while speaking with the police. He later pleaded guilty to DUI, for which he was given a suspended one-year jail sentence. His probationary period had concluded in January of 2019. For the fatal Las Vegas accident, Rodriguez was given a prison term of 6 to 20 years. Anderson's family expressed dissatisfaction with the punishment, claiming the drunk driver should have been charged with murder. 
Thanks for watching. Would you rather inherit a large estate and lead a comfortable but purposeless life or work extremely hard for decades, affording you and your descendants financial security in the process? Let us know in the comment section below.